Welcome to Make ForeFlight Your Own with Custom Content. In this webinar, we'll discuss ways custom content can help you customize your ForeFlight experience. That can include making flight planning easier or having access to information in flight that you wouldn't have otherwise, and so much more. Let's go ahead and meet our presenters for today. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am Sarah Kenny. I'm the Military and Custom Content Product Manager. I've been with ForeFlight for about three years, and I am a freshly minted private pilot. Hello everyone, I'm Joey Arena. I'm the Senior Customer Success Coordinator for Military Products here at ForeFlight. I'm a commercial helicopter pilot in CFI, and I've been with ForeFlight for four years now. Hello everybody, I'm Dion Mitten. I'm a commercial seaplane pilot. I've uh, flown in regions where I really wanted to see the areas from above, so I spent some time in the Caribbean, New York's East River, and also Alaska. Thanks guys. Taking a closer look at the topics we have coming up today, we'll start by defining custom content, what it is, who uses it, and discuss the wide variety of use cases it has. Then we'll look at the types of custom content and where you can find them in ForeFlight once you import them. Dion will then give us a few examples of how he uses information online to create his own custom content and find other content that is already in a compatible format. After that, we'll start looking at the easiest ways to create each type of custom content, and Joey will demonstrate how you can put your own custom content together in minutes using Google Earth. After that, Dion will show us his iPad, so you can see how his content packs are set up to help him plan flights and pull up useful information in flight as he flies seaplanes in some exciting places around the world. And then we'll take a few questions in Q&A at the end. Before we get into today's presentation, we're going to reference a sample content pack that you can download and try for yourself. You can find it at foreflight.com slash custom dash content. We're also going to include a link to that page and any other links we mentioned during today's webinar in an email that you're going to get after this webinar ends. I also want to mention briefly who has access to custom content. If you pay for your own ForeFlight account, you're an individual user, custom content is included in all subscription plans. If you're part of a business account, you have to be on business performance to use custom content. And if you're a military or government customer, you have to be on MFB Performance or our newest subscription plan, MFB1. Before we begin, you can ask questions using the GoToWebinar message panel on the right side of your screen. We have a team of people standing by to help respond to them, but be sure to submit them as soon as you think of them. As we get toward the end of webinars, the number of questions tends to increase, so we may not be able to get back to you. If we don't get back to you, be sure to send your question to team at foreflight.com. If you encounter audio problems during today's webinar, we recommend joining from a computer and not a mobile device. And the session is being recorded and it will be accessible by this time tomorrow at foreflight.com slash webinars. With that, let's get started. All right, I always like to begin uh, talking about custom content with a little bit of background to give context uh, on the difference between custom content and content packs because they uh, often are interchangeably used and um, people conflate the two of them and they're not the same. So custom content refers to the suite of features that we have within ForeFlight uh, that allows you to bring in any of your customized aeronautical data. And content packs are the vehicle through which you can organize this data and transfer it easily back and forth. So who is using custom content? Essentially, uh, pilots with all different varying missions are using custom content. Uh, some of the examples that we typically see are pilots doing aerial survey, agriculture. Um, you can see the list here, especially wildland firefighting is a big one that we see frequently. Uh, your flight school might be taking advantage of custom content and distributing information that's relevant to your local area to you. Um, pipeline and power line inspectors, and in particular, the military is our largest user of custom content. Uh, and that's part of why um, I oversee both military and custom content features within ForeFlight as a product manager. So in beginning our discussion about custom content, we have two forms of data. We have rasterized data and vectorized data. Rasterized data is what we're talking about like base maps. We're talking about a chart that used to sit on a table, you know, sectionals, IFR high and low charts, any custom charts that you would actually find in paper copy, these get digitized and we call these rasterized data. They are brought in digitally using pixels. So it's actually a kind of like a scanned photo of a map 
that then gets geo-referencing so that it can be actually placed on top of a moving map. They come in a very fixed resolution. So as you zoom in on these maps, depending on the quality of the image, they may begin to have error in them, become blurry. They may not be as finely tuned depending on the resolution that they were actually created in. And, you know, you do need to ensure that you're using quality data when you're bringing rasterized data in so that you can get accurate data. Uh, one of those areas is in understanding projections, because if you are trying to get a piece of paper map that's drawn in one projection and the digital sphere that you're working in is in another projection, the two may not be able to work together. For a flight, we use a Mercator projection for our digitized globe. So we definitely want to make sure that we're using like a Lambert conical or a, Merc a straight Mercator projection when you're bringing in these rasterized images into ForeFlight. Uh, the two main format types that we use are GeoPDF and MB tiles. GeoPDF is going to be the, mo the most robust because you're starting off with a very high quality uh, image file. You're adding some geo-referencing data to it, and then it just works very well on our moving maps. It also works like our embedded PDF charts where you actually have the ability to work with opacity and hide these images using the settings cog on the moving map. Whereas an MB tiles file is just literally a digitized image that you just lay on top of the base map and then the rest of the digital layers can be placed on top of it from that point forward. Now, when we're talking about vectorized data, uh, we went through rasterized data talking about how they're the bottom, they're the base maps, but vectorized data are overlay images. Think about weather radar and clouds and shape files, which are like circles and squares and lines, or waypoints themselves. A waypoint can be placed on top of a base map so that you can be able to look at points of interest as you're flight planning. So that's where vectorized data comes in. It's a smaller file size, and it's easier to work with in digital map scenarios. They're overlaid on top of the base maps, and the resolution always stays the same, whether you zoom in or out, because it's a dynamic image file. So you can see the waypoints as you zoom in, they're going to stay there. They're not going to increase as you zoom in on top of them. Types of vectorized data, the most common ones out there that I work with are going to be in the KML and KMZ formats. Uh, both of these were invented by Google. And what you're looking at is a very simple textual concept of shapes, lines, and waypoints. And uh, I'll be showing you here a little while later how to build some of these shape files inside of Google Earth here. But these are the most common. Uh, uh, the only difference between a KML and a KMZ is a KMZ is like a compressed file that creates multiple pieces of data inside of the one file, kind of like our content packs do. And then KMLs are just individual shape file layers that are generated. Now, outside of that, you can import CSVs as well. And CSVs are commerce separated values. That's like just putting in lat long coordinates inside of a spreadsheet like Excel or numbers. And then the last one that we support is GeoJSON, which is a JavaScript object, which you're just using Java to uh, give boundary extents for creating shape files and waypoints. Now, ForeFlight also offers our own proprietary user waypoint system where you can actually use our moving map and do a long press on the moving map to create your own user waypoints. We actually store these on our database inside of your device, and we have the ability to uh, share these waypoints with other users uh, using our embedded share feature as well. User waypoints also sync between your devices. So if you have your user waypoints on your iPad, those user waypoints will be transferred over to your iPhone as well, depending on how your account's set up and how many devices you can utilize. 
these are going to be a foundational function in the future development of custom content in ForeFlight. We have some very exciting things on the horizon uh, coming in with user waypoints in the future. You can export user waypoints that are created inside of ForeFlight out into a KML layer. And then these are easily imported into other map viewing tools, such as Google Earth. You can input unique properties such as descriptions and elevations as well. So these will actually be placed in a 3D graphical format. Now here's a power users tip for you. Um, if you've ever opened for flight on the maps page and you, you pull down the map layer selector, we've got two columns. And one thing you might not know is that these columns are actually separated by the types of data that they contain. The left side of the column is raster data. So these are going to be your base maps. While on the right side of the column, these are going to be your vector data layers. So these are your overlays, like your weather and your user waypoints and shape files. So we actually divide these into the two different types. They're in the layer selector. Custom content can also be pre-made and found at many locations on the web. Dion, what are some of the places where you find pre-built custom content online? Thanks, Joey. So two of the sources of information that, um, that I bring in using uh, content packs, one is, uh, the, the source of one is the FAA uh, sub, uh, chart supplement information. It's published every 56 days. It's typically, it is distributed in electronic format. Um, and it contains uh, supplemental information for en route charts and such. I extract a piece of that information which is not charted, uh, is not presented in terms of an electronic format, and I actually uh, vectorize that um, and overlay it as one of my uh, custom content um, layers when I use the map view. The other, uh, the FAA does publish information as well, um, but also the National Park Service and another source of information for, uh, for example, in uh, the uncontrolled airspaces of Alaska, for example, the Denali, the Denali National Park Service or the National Park Service publishes a KML formatted data set representing the air taxi reporting points, which I'll show a little bit later on. So once you've aggregated all of your different types of custom content, you can bundle them together into what we call a content pack. And uh, what, what kind of benefits are you getting out of it if you use content packs? So firstly, they are really easily shared between users uh, and through our Cloud Drive integration, which we'll be talking about a couple slides from now. It's also easier to organize all of this information once it's on your device. And then content packs also have some enhanced capabilities uh, like waypoint attachments, which we'll be demonstrating here shortly. So content packs 101, how are they structured? Uh, a content pack is a zip file that ForeFlight is uh, uniquely set up to unpack and organize within the application and make all of these different assets show up in the relevant place where they should be living. Uh, and there's a couple components that each content pack uh, should have. Uh, you don't have to have any of these portions though. All of this is optional. Um, obviously you should probably pick a couple and if you complete the entire pack, uh, you'll have a, a more robust end product product, but um, certainly all of this is, is optional. So firstly, uh, we have the manifest. It is a, a JSON file that uh, can include a, a whole slew of information. Um, some of the notable items that uh, you might be interested in including are expiration and effective dates, which uh, will kind of give you an indication of whether you're using old data when you open up plates uh, or other documents that have an effective date. Uh, you can also include version, title, and organization names. So if you are bringing in custom content from uh, maybe a flight school and another public source, uh, you can recognize the source of that data. We also have the opportunity for a folder called BYOP, Bring Your Own Procedures. Uh, so these are associated with any airport that's in the ForeFlight database. Uh, anything that you put in this folder will show up in the procedure view. And what I especially like about BYOP is that it supports opacity and annotations. Uh, so you can um, manage those overlays and, and still see your base map once you have uh, these layers opened up in the map view. 
And any type of notes that you jot down on them from the plates view will also show up once you overlay them on the map. The next folder is layers. That's where all of your rasterized and vectorized data goes that Joey uh, discussed previously. And the last folder is nav data, uh, where you can create custom waypoints and uh, attach document assets to them. Here's an example on the right of what that folder structure will look like. This is the ForeFlight sample content pack that's available on our website. And you can see a breakdown of all of the different file types uh, that live within this content pack. So once you have your content pack uh, created or downloaded, this is an example of what it will look like in app. Uh, so you can see you have your different custom maps in blue. In pink, we have all of the associated files, uh, all of those assets that can be attached to a waypoint. In purple, we have uh, anything that is considered a bring your own procedure. Those can be uh, static PDFs or uh, dynamic geo-referenced PDFs. And then in orange, we have anything that is a custom chart. Uh, so we have an MB tile example, any of those uh, rasterized or vectorized assets that Joey taught us about. So if you want to get started creating your own custom content packs, uh, what I actually recommend doing is downloading that sample pack from our website. Um, that gives you all of the, the structure or the skeleton that you need to fill all of these folders. So um, here's an example of each of the different types that can go into each folder that lives within that sample pack. Um, so you can have PDFs and KMLs in your nav data. Uh, we have a GeoJSON in your layers and then a PDF in your BYOP. Once you have all of the data packed into each of those folders, you can uh, nest them under a parent level uh, and then compress that file and turn it into a zip. And then that zip uh, is easily transferable into ForeFlight. So Bring Your Own Plates is a really powerful tool, but it does require some specific structuring in the file title for ForeFlight to understand uh, where each asset should be assigned um, within the application. So uh, this is an example of the uh, standard BYOP naming structure that you should adhere to. Uh, you need to have your airport identifier, an underscore with the folder name, uh, and then the document name as well. And that's how you can get them to seamlessly show up uh, within the procedure view of any airport. One of the really empowering capabilities of content packs is that they are shared very easily amongst users. Uh, so we have several methods that you can do that. You uh, can set up a cloud drive integration. We support Box, uh, Dropbox, or AWS uh, GovCloud. To set up a cloud drive integration, uh, you do that through plan.forflight.com, uh, through our ForeFlight web. If you're part of a group ForeFlight account that has several users linked to the same Cloud Drive integration, you might want to take note of some of the settings that we have available uh, that will either force users to download everything that's within the Cloud Drive or allow them to pick and choose uh, to make the best use of the space available on their device. We can also share content packs over Slack or Teams. Uh, we have a special hyperlink schema that you can find on our website that allows you to uh, hang content packs out on the internet for people to go download. You can also share them over email. And lastly, you can share them through Finder uh, or iTunes, depending on whether you have a Mac or a Windows device. All right, so how do we get started authoring custom content? As you can see, there is a host of different resources that you can use. Um, in particular, my favorite is Google My Maps. It's quite simple to start with has a very low barrier of entry, uh, but there's certainly more complex tools out there. And I'm gonna hand it over to Joey to demonstrate how to get started. So let's create some custom content together. I'm going to be using Google Earth Pro. And for this example, I recently had some family travel in from out of town. And I'm from South Texas in the Houston area and a very popular area to fly down to and do sightseeing from the air is Galveston Island. There are many interesting places to fly around near Galveston Island. So one thing that I have done in the past is I have added some waypoints as points of interest to show people from the air. So today we'll do the exact same thing. I'm going to create three specific waypoints in Galveston Island and then I'll show you how to save those from Google Earth, and then we can import those into ForeFlight. So starting from Google Earth, I have it open, 
and I've zoomed into Galveston Island. Well, when everybody comes to Galveston Island, there is a very famous ferry system, and it connects mainland Texas down to Galveston Island. So it's a nice place to be able to view. So as we fly in, I can add a waypoint by clicking on the drop pin marker, drag that marker where I want it to go, and then I can name that waypoint. I can add that one. We can add another point for where the ferries actually go into Galveston Port. And then from there, I like to fly along the port area because there's normally some cruise ships in port that we can fly by. So I can add the port area where they park and I can call that the cruise ships and other attractions. From there, a very famous area is known as Moody Gardens. They actually have some full-size pyramids that they've built there. One is an aquarium and one is a rainforest. So I can also add those as a nice place to visit. So I can drop the waypoint down. I can say Moody Gardens. Click OK. We'll be right over the airport at that point. They have no problem with tourist activity, so they're used to this every day. And then the last place, I like to fly the entire beach, but I like to fly down to San Luis Pass. It's a very famous place to go fishing, very easy access. So I'll place this as our final marker. And then I will say San Luis Pass. Save that. All right, excellent. So on the left hand side over here, now we have all five waypoints. I'm going to select all of them. Then I'm going to combine them. And now I'm going to save the place as. I'm going to save it to my downloads. And it's going to save as a KMZ file. A KMZ file is a compressed KML file. So it's very similar to a zip file. So it just means that it's compressed with all of the data into one singular file that makes it easy. I'm going to name this Galveston by Air. Click the Save button. Now when we look in our Downloads folder, we can see we have Galveston by Air as a KMZ. And here's a power user tip for you related to settings. Uh, by default, Forflate will auto zoom to the extent of your custom content. But if you are frequently turning on and off different resources, this can kind of be jarring as you're flying along uh, and having your whole map view essentially scramble to, to re-zoom to all of that information. Uh, so we introduced the auto zoom to custom content setting. Uh, if you go to more settings and layer selector, you'll notice you have a new toggle available for you. Uh, so you can set this up for your own preference, whether you want it to zoom to all of your custom content or not. Um, it's also important to note that you can still use the send to map icon from the custom content screen to see the geolocation of any of your custom content. So if you happen to maybe forget where that piece lives in the world, you can still have the setting turned off and be able to see where information exists. So now that we've learned all about custom content, we are going to have Dion demonstrate some of the practical ways that he is using it in his day-to-day -day operations. Thanks, Sarah and Joey. Uh, I'd like to show you guys a little bit of what I do um, with ForeFlight as my electronic flight bag and things that I've incorporated into my workflow that makes it a little bit easier to, to use these features. But before we get to that point, the reason why I'm doing all of this or why I'm using this tool set the way I do is primarily for safety. 
Situational awareness is very, very important in the Alaska flying. Uh, the way I use my electronic flight bag, it's either on a kneeboard or it's on the yoke. And I have it up and running on the moving map all the time. The reason why Alaska is uh, both fascinating from a scenery perspective and from a flying perspective, very technically challenging, is for the most part, it's an off-grid environment. During the seaplane, commercial seaplane operations, uh, we conduct VFR only, VFR daytime operations, uh, and it's mostly conducted in uncontrolled airspace. There are three types of data that I'll show you today and uh, that comes in handy in the kind of flying that I do in and around the um, South Central Alaska area. And the first one is, um, a vectored view of chart information uh, that I customize. And the reason why I do that is because it's not electronically available. Uh, the method that I follow is pretty much the same as what Joey had just explained using Google Earth, constructing a polygon, exporting it as a KML, uh, overlaying that, uh, packaging that into a custom content pack uh, with supplemental information uploading it to my Dropbox uh, file share, and then integrating that with my ForeFlight application. So that workflow works really well. This is not something that gets done on the day of my flight. This is information that I capture way in advance. And the polygon kind of information is, as you might imagine, fairly static. So in the second example that I'll show today, uh, I'll demonstrate the, the polygon information and how it's overlaid and, how, and why it is really helpful in the flying that I do. But the first example that I want to highlight out of three is the Denali National Park or the Denali Wilderness Area. I uh, fly commercial floats in and around the Anchorage uh, Airport area. And within this region, um, uh, which is located in the south central part of Alaska, there is a very high volume of air traffic. So the commercial seaplane operation is based out of the Anchorage area, which as you can see on this map has quite a few airports in the vicinity, and the Lake Hood seaplane base is adjacent to the Anchorage International Airport. Uh, when I zoom in a little bit, you can see that the, there is a big uh, runway complex east-west and uh, north-south, which is the Anchorage uh, terminal area. Uh, you'll notice the seaplane, which the seaplane uh, designator, which is the Lake Hood seaplane base. And just let me show you the proximity. It's less than half a mile from that main runway, that parallel set. Um, and then to add some interesting flavor there's another runway which is uh, about a mile just to the to the north of anchorage so this as you might imagine is fairly congested just in terms of proximity but then look a little bit to the northeast you have um, two or three more airfields um, which of course creates more traffic into this terminal area so the departure and the arrival sequences in and out of lake hood becomes fairly problematic just as a function of the um, uh, traffic separation. And this makes for fairly interesting arrivals and departures from the Lake Hood Seaplane Base with uh, Anchorage International to the south, Merrill Field, and also the, um, the military airfield, uh, Elmendorf, just to the northeast. So to use the method uh, that Joey had just explained, the polygon method to, to draw some shapes and overlay them onto this map view is very helpful for situational awareness and I'll show you why. Uh, remember, this is mostly uncontrolled airspace to the north of Anchorage. So when I pull up just the aerial view, you can see that it's mostly wilderness. There's a bunch of lakes, there are a ton of rivers. There's some uh, topography to the left, to the west here. But this is the valley where a lot of the commercial operation happens. There are virtually no roads. There is one road, um, but most of the operation happens to the west of that. So when you're looking at this map, you see the confluence of the two rivers, the Yentna and the Susitna, and a lot of just tiny, tiny lakes. 
So after uploading the custom content pack via my Dropbox share, it's available in ForeFlight. Um, so while I'm flying, I can activate this layer. And I do this by tapping on the, the map uh, icon at the top left. And if I scroll to the on the right hand nav that pops up, I can activate this one here, which is the second from the bottom, Matsu CTAF. The Matsu CTAF in, will overlay, and now that I've activated, will overlay a few polygons onto this area. And you'll see that I've color coded them. Uh, one is red, one is blue. There's a another one to the southwest here, which is black. And you can see it's all uh, encompassing this natural wilderness area. There's a big mountain range to the west, but of course this butts up to the to the bottom, to the valley side. So where it gets really interesting is, uh, again, we have Anchorage at the bottom of the screen. As we're flying up into this region, each of these uh, polygons or these regions uh, are defined as a different, uh, as a switchover point for CTAF uh, radio frequencies. And so in areas where it gets really interesting, this is the town of uh, Wasilla, just to the northeast of Anchorage. A lot of our flights go into this region and you can see here's an interesting inter intersection where right over a bridge in the middle of the river, three of these uh, regions uh, converge. And this might not be so interesting initially, but if you're flying in this area a lot, you'll realize that there is a lot of traffic because this is a, this is a, a very busy egress and ingress point to the uh, Kanik Valley, which is uh, just to the, to the east of that. So a lot of the traffic flies up from Anchorage. They kind of follow the road. They uh, fly by Birch, uh, Birchwood Airport, and then they um, uh, they steer to the east. And this is the place where three radio frequencies are important. So if you're flying in a VFR-equipped airplane, you have a, 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 a standby radio and an active radio, but you obviously um, can toggle between the two frequencies. If you have two radios, you can be monitoring uh, two other frequencies while you're on the active. So you can have three going at the same time. If you don't have that luxury, it's important to be switching over uh, and to the accurate frequencies so that you can get to understand what's going on with the traffic. The reason why CTAF is very important is for the most part, again, this is uncontrolled airspace, we rely on radio communications a lot for situational awareness and to find out where the other pilots are. So this again, if you look at the valley, you can see that there are a few other interesting spots like here just uh, to the south of uh, Talkeetna, another switchover point where you have two sections converging and the switchover point is just on the west side of the river on the western side of the bridge. Now by constructing this I can while I'm flying in this region I have a moving map and I can have a good view and a good situational awareness of these crossover points in terms of radio frequencies. And you'll see that uh, when I zoom into this area here, you would imagine that they would have put it along the river, the Yentna is to the left and the Susitna to the right, but they did not. So <clears throat> what a lot of pilots might get confused on in this kind of uh, transition point is they might think that it's the river. Well, it is right at this point here, but a little bit further to the north, it's actually to the west of that river. The one important thing to note, um, the source of my information here for the CTAF, for this CTAF, these CTAF boundaries is out of the FAA uh, chart supplement. Of course, this data gets refreshed every 56 days. So this is the kind of thing that if you do it like uh, what I've done, if you use this methodology, you do import it into ForeFly, just be aware that it has to be refreshed periodically. The second example of uh, how I find custom content and using content packs to import data very useful is in the very, very busy uh, region of the Denali National Park. Now, before I show you the content and how I map this and, and what it eventually looks like on the map view, here's a few things um, th that you might consider, uh, and it might apply into the areas where you fly as well, but Denali is a very interesting part of the world to be flying VFR floats. And here's a few things to consider. The Denali area is very congested because there's a large volume of aerial sightseeing, 
base camp utility flights as well as helicopter flights for a variety of reasons. Because of the high density of traffic, situational awareness becomes really problematic in this area. The terrain here is impressive, to say the least. Denali is the tallest mountain in North America at just over 20,000 feet. And the terrain is varying between uh, at the bottom part of the mountain, 3000 uh, MSL, and some of the operators go up to a little bit of over 10,000 feet. Uh, when we're flying in this region, a lot of the traffic is bunched together between like 7,000 MSL and about 11 or 12,000 MSL. Against the backdrop of these mountains, it's near impossible to spot the other aircraft, um, not only because uh, the, the terrain and the topography, but there's also a variety of speeds and uh, directions of flight. Another reason why this is a particularly challenging environment, because of the high altitude and during summertime, as you might imagine, we're dealing with high density altitude operations. For a resup aircraft, uh, anywhere between uh, 8,000 and 12,000, you're getting close to the serviceable ceiling. Uh, if you're fully loaded, it's near impossible to, um, to maneuver quick. Uh, at between 8,000 and 11,000 MSL, you might be looking at a 10 to 14,000 uh, density altitude. So uh, performance becomes a very uh, key element to manage. And then lastly, again, I did mention uh, in this region, we have a mix of fixed wing and helicopter traffic. There's a mix of floats, wheels and um, skis going on at any given time during the summertime operations. Now let me show you on a map why this is, uh, besides all the topography that I just mentioned, why this is particularly interesting. So uh, again, on the aerial view, on the map view, I'll activate this layer and I've packaged this in a cont uh, content pack uh, by the name of, and I named this air taxi locations. The source of this information is, as Joey mentioned previously, um, there are a variety of sources of information out there. This data set comes from the National Park Service. It's maintained by them and it's uh, identified as a list of air taxi reporting points. So now given that I've told you that this is a he heavily trafficked area, you might imagine that there are rules of the road, which yes, there are. Uh, it's always right side traffic up the glacier or up the valley. And once I zoom out, you'll see exactly what I mean. But here's an example of specifically why the traffic volume and the reporting point uh, density is very, very significant and probably unlike any other region in North America. So take a look at these two reporting points. Well, first of all, they came up with very creative names. We're looking at Moose's Tooth is the very top one, Root Canal, Middle and Espresso. Well, you can see once I put my ruler up here that Moose's Tooth and Root Canal is but half a mile apart. So in any flying scenario, half a mile is a few seconds. Uh, combine that with the fact that we're dealing with 8,000 and 10,000 feet elevation here. These points are very close to each other. They're in a high density altitude environment. And so the one thing that uh, from a VFR flying perspective, a single pilot operation perspective, the radio is very active in this region. Position reporting goes on all the time. And so you would want to know when uh, you're at Root Canal and somebody calls southbound or opposite direction at Moose's Tooth that they might be coming your way. But here's why this is really important to have all of this waypoint and reporting data at your fingertips when you're flying in this region. As I'm zooming out, you guys can get a feel for the volume of reporting point data that goes on in this region. So all the blue tags are the reporting points in this Denali, this greater mountain area where we do our air taxi operation or our sightseeing operation. So there's too many to count. But as we're flying up these glaciers, for example, the Ruth Glacier, the one on the right of these two, there are rules of the road. Uh, it's always right side traffic. So as you're flying up uh, gradually upsloping terrain, you're keeping to the right. And of course, opposite traffic will be 
if they follow the rules, uh, will be on the opposite side of the glacier. And just for context, these glaciers are two miles, but obviously you're not going to be up there. So you're about a, a one mile apart. However, you might get to intersections like this to Backside Lake, uh, which comes down the Backside Glacier. If you look at this T uh, intersection here, and I'm at the Ruth Icefall. So let's say that I'm flying south in this picture uh, and I'm reporting just a beam, the Ruth Icefall. There is this huge piece of rock between my location and Backside Lake. If another airplane is exiting the Backside Glacier and coming down onto the Ruth Glacier, which will they, they'll make a right-hand turn. I expect them to make a right-hand turn. They might just merge onto my traffic if I'm flying south. Well, what if they want to go north? They have to uh, cut in front of me and they have to cross in front of me to the other side of the glacier. All of this means that there are a bunch of conflicting um, points in this mountainous terrain that look exactly like this. So it's key to be on the radio and to understand and fully comprehend the location of other aircraft because they're using these reporting point identifiers. There is simply no way that you can reliably um, just use visual um, identification as your primary source of deconflicting when you're flying this area. Uh, there's a few other examples. Here's the, the lower toke, uh, upper toke, upper Y of the toke, and the lower Y of the toke. Same kind of thing. You can see that there's a intersection, and at the intersection, of course, you would want to know what's going on. So this is the Denali uh, mountain flying area. There is a single CTAF frequency um, on the southern part and there's another separation for the northern part. But for the most part, this is a very congested area. Um, when I fly in this region, I have this up on my moving map. Uh, I have it zoomed in almost all the way so that I can see uh, the reporting points and I can make them out on my moving map. So that if an airplane reports a point and I don't, in my scan, I don't see it on my map, um, and then I know they're probably further than five miles away and, and uh, less, of a con less of an immediate concern. Okay, and in my third example, let's just deactivate the Denali reporting points because it clutters up the map. And here's an example of what, um, what Sarah just covered in uh, the construct of the content pack. Uh, I'm using... Uh, the way I constructed this data, let me activate it. I go to the drop down on the map and uh, call up my Dion Alaska. So, of course, I've color coded these to have different labels, and you can see that I, we're pretty much in the same region, but much sparser data. The data here is again not the kind of information that I would be generating on the day of, or I might do it as part of my pre-flight planning the day prior, but this is typical data that doesn't change or move a lot. And this is where I use the layering and the supplemental data to augment the information that I can bring onto the map and onto the moving map while I'm flying. Uh, again, back to what I said about the mode of operation, this is a very highly congested uh, region, all VFR, um, and the moving map is my one of my instruments that I have in my VFR cockpit to help um, bring situational awareness. So the information that I capture here, you can see by the by the tags or by the labels, have English names. They're names of the locations: Butterfly Lake, Yenses, Flathorn Lake, Switch etc etc by using the content pack construct i can overlay georeferenced rich information and give me let me give you an example rainy pass lodge uh, if i select that and i navigate to my supplemental information here is a bit of information that i've collected off the internet. You can think of this comes off of Wikipedia or any source of information that's useful and relevant. And I can attach this document in the form of a PDF that gives me relevant information about this location. Uh, and in this example, this is just Wikipedia cut and paste. And remember that I mentioned that this is an off-grid environment, so there is no internet access while we're flying. Um, even if it does exist, I cannot access anything. And the way for me to bring in this information into this off-grid environment is by using the content pack uh, mechanism. 
I bring this data in in the format of a PDF and of course Forflight allows me to easily access the information. Again I'll show you, I click on the flag there, I navigate to the supplemental info and there I have the information. This happens to be Alaska's oldest hunting and recreation lodge and uh, this might be useful information not so much for navigation but remember again in the tourist operation there's very interesting information about all of this in environment that can be shared with passengers and this helps with creating the experience especially in a single pilot operation uh, I'm flying and I'm doing things safely from a aviation perspective but I'm also the tour guide so this is where this information might be helpful. Another interesting reason for importing this data, I'll show you the Seven Mile Lake example. Here you can see my document has a few pages as I flip through and I've brought in some images which are photographs that I took from this lake and from this location. But here's the interesting piece. Um, I can bring in any kind of screen capture like I've done here and it'll help me with identifying the the location from the air, but I can annotate it with interesting bits of um, information that's useful to pilots that's not published anywhere. For example, Moosehorn Lodge is a small family lodge. It's located at the far northern end of the lake. And here's some info about the dock. And now, unless you fly in there frequently, you wouldn't know this. You might spot it from the air, but this is the kind of uh, information that we have as float plane pilots when we visit these locations regularly. There is a floating dock. It can accommodate two seaplanes. It's in a fairly good condition. Yes, there are cleats. These are all interesting and important facts when you're approaching the dock, when you there might not be a dock hand, you're a single pilot. Um, here's some interesting information that you might not have thought of. Docking is from the south, preferred on the left side docking. Why? Because the pilot is on the left side. The problem is it's also very shallow on the southern side of the dock. So these are the kinds of bits and pieces of information that's useful as a reminder. As a pilot, when I fly to these locations, you might not fly there in two weeks or three weeks. And when you go back, you can just use this as a refresher. Uh, when you're approaching from the northern side, deeper water, uh, blah, blah, blah. Here's an interesting photo that I thought might be useful. This is a picture of the dock. You can see that it's somewhat floating, but it's not a sizable dock. The beaver barely fits in there. And here's another one at the backside where the uh, 206 is docked. Another view. So again, the PDF fo document format is a very handy uh, format for uh, encapsulating and then attaching this uh, additional information to the um, to the GPS waypoints. So here you can see a different view of the beaver at the dock. This is a the fuel truck beaver and this is a very frequent visitor to all these lodges, the remote lodges. They need to get fuel and um, uh, I happen to be docked in the 206 at the back and the beaver, the white beaver to the right and I took a quick photo of what the operation looks like. So this is also interesting to share with other pilots in the fleet so that if they get to go to Seven Mile Lake and they approach and they see the two docks, they would be in this picture approaching from the right hand side. They might be tempted to go for the first dock uh, because it's on the left and you can dock there. But this might be useful information for them to also know that when the, when the uh, fuel truck arrives, this is the dock where they need to be because as if, if you can see in this picture on the left hand side, there's the fuel pump and all the assembly that uh, that's required to unload the fuel. Here's something interesting that you might not have thought of. In a lot of the locations uh, in the Alaska region, all of these lakes are surrounded by fairly tall trees um, and the shorelines are for the most part obscured. So while approaching a lake from uh, any direction might be a relatively easy task, the takeoff procedure is very, very hazardous and for the following reason. And this is uh, some of the information that I noted here for Seven Mile. When you're taking off from this lake and let's say you have calm winds, uh, you might be tempted to take off to the south uh, from the dock because that's the quickest way that you can get in the air. It also gives you the longest runway. The problem with a, a, a southbound departure is if there is a slight northerly wind, you might be able to take a tailwind um, and it doesn't bother you because the lake is 2,000 feet long. But let's say you do that, 
this situational awareness of other airplanes in the air in the area other aircraft in the area and even arriving aircraft is useful seaplanes here will fly a short appro approach they will tend to fly a left traffic but the short approach and the left base would be, be obscured by the trees so when you're on the water you're taxiing out and or starting your takeoff roll and you're sitting on the step you will not see an approaching airplane because not only are they just above the tree line they're also out of sight because they're flying a short approach so I make special note of things like make sure you do the radio calls, watch for the left base, watch for the short final for low flying aircraft because they would be directly opposite your traffic and you might not see them until the very last moment. Now, of course, there are rights of way rules and you being on the water and all of that, but you still want the situational awareness. Um, and every time I read this, I might do an extra two or three uh, 360 turns on the water just to make sure that my departure uh, direction is is clear. Let me show you another interesting example. A lot of the flights out of uh, Anchorage uh, towards the bear viewing activities tracks along the western side of the Cook Inlet. The Cook Inlet is this big body of water and you'll see that I've uh, flagged some uh, interesting points on the left here on the western side. Mount Iliamna. There's a bunch of volcanoes on the western side of the Cook Inlet, which makes for very, very scenic um, flying and scenic uh, views as you track along the coastline. And it's also a long flight. It's, uh, if you're tracking the coastline, it's at least an hour that you have time to entertain the, uh, the passengers and say some interesting things about the region. Here I use the PDF just to give me some facts and uh, trivia about the region. Uh, what the passengers might be seeing out the window and I combined it into this PDF. So I have Mount Katmai, Iliamna, Redoubt, Mount Spur. There's many of them. And this is also again an easy way for me to just pull it up. I don't have to switch an app out of uh, ForeFlight. I don't have to go to my notes app. I can just have it all ready and handy. And let's say again I'm in this view. I happen to be in the PDF viewer and uh, for some reason I want to click back to the map very quickly I can just navigate quickly by clicking on the on the maps uh, icon at the bottom okay so those are the three ways that I use custom content and using the content pack uh, mechanism to bring the information into ForeFlight uh, either the the polygon method or just the custom uh, supplemental data uh, and I find the content pack mechanism really handy um, for combining all of this information, for then uh, adding it to the map layer, for having easy access. And all in all, uh, when we're flying VFR in this environment, uh, for the reason of either congestion, traffic, high traffic volume, and or terrain and high density altitude, having this information available at your fingertips, like what I just demonstrated here, it adds an extra layer of supplemental information in the cockpit that helps me uh, with my situational awareness in this region. Thanks, Dion. And thank you, Sarah and Joey, as well. Before we jump into Q&A, I want to point out a few useful links for you. And don't worry about copying these down right now. We'll be sure to send them all in an email in about an hour. First, you can learn more about custom content at foreflight.com slash custom dash content. You can also learn more in our pilot's guide, which you can find online at foreflight.com slash pilots guide, or you can just open it up in ForeFlight. In the documents tab, go to the ForeFlight drive, and the first thing you'll see there is the pilot's guide. You can register for more webinars and watch past ones at foreflight.com slash webinars, and you can contact the pilot support team at team at foreflight.com. With that, let's move on to some questions. Uh, thank you all so much for submitting all these great questions today. Um, we've gotten several here. Uh, Joey, I'll pitch the first one to you. Uh, we cannot import KML files in the web application. Is there a plan to develop this? That's a great question, and it's often asked to the support team here at ForeFlight. One of the, uh, it's really a device limitation right now. So custom content is only supported in the iOS applications. We are looking for ways in the future to be able to add custom user waypoints and custom shape files and content packs into the web portal, but it's just not supported right now due to the fact that, you know, they're two separate programs. You've got iOS based and HTML based programs. So getting a file that'll work well on both 
both applications is a little difficult, but we'll get it solved one day. But for now, uh, custom content's just supported in the iOS application. Awesome, thanks, Joey. The next question is also for you as well. Uh, someone asking, I fly for a part 135 operation. How does custom content apply to me? I'm not sure which category I fit into. Um, so what uh, use cases have you seen custom content used in? Absolutely. So custom content, it's just this big, broad topic. It can be anything that you really want it to be. I've worked with 135 operators in the past. One of the best products I've seen is when like 135 operators have either custom approaches into private airports or they have their own company notes. A lot of those operators like to use the BYOP because while we actually register all of the airports that have IKO identifiers on them, with the BYOP protocols, you can build your own PDF file and have your own company notes for even airports that you know are off the beaten path. Uh, you know, uh, as a commercial helicopter pilot myself, uh, when I flew 135 offshore, then you were able to, uh, or the operators that I've worked with, they have you know fuel platforms and contact frequencies and all of that information. So you know, it's really as broad as it can be, but it can be tailored for exactly what you're looking for. Great, thanks, Joey. Uh, I'll take the next question. Uh, is there a common place to share content packs or find sh user shared data? Um, the short answer is no, there's not right now. Forflight doesn't have an online site for sharing them, but for f there are several third-party groups that have um, posted custom content online. So I'll just quickly show one example um, on my iPad here. This is from the Arizona Flight Training Work Group, and they work to promote uh, flight safety all around the Phoenix area, all throughout Arizona. I think we've all, uh, I think we all know that that's a pretty busy, that's a pretty busy airspace with flight training. So down here, you'll see that there are, this is the uh, custom content that they've put together. So you can see all these training areas up here in Prescott, all the way down to all the airports all around Phoenix. So all the flight schools, uh, use this content so they can all just be on the same page while they're in the air. All right, the next question I have uh, is for Joey as well. Uh, can we create content packs or is that something that we have to get from ForeFlight? So when we're talking about content packs, most of our user content is provided by you, the actual end user. So we're, you're, we're going to rely on you to build the KMZ files or your importing your own MB tiles or custom geo PDFs into the program. So ForeFlight doesn't actually provide more than just our trial samples for how to build and structure the custom content files together. Uh, it's actually going to be relied upon on the end user to create their own custom content. Great, thanks. One more question for you, Joey. Yep. Um, how do you geo reference a PDF? Oh, that's a very complicated question. So yes, uh, georeferencing a PDF is, going. you're going to need an external software program. I personally love using Map Publisher. It seems to be the most user-friendly, but it does rely on using Adobe Illustrator and able to use it. Uh, if you go to forflight.com and go to our support pages, you can actually search for how to georeference a PDF and our brilliant technical writer grant uh built a very nice support page there that will bring you to a free product called qgis this is a freeware gis solution that will help work through how to bring in a high quality image file and then add geo referencing information to it and export it into a geo pdf form and again this is free source software so you can do it I know that a lot of the topics in this webinar were very, very techy. So we had some of those comments come into the question area. So yes, this is going to be more on the high tech realm of how to georeference a PDF, but it can be done. Uh, that support document is definitely where I would start off with. And if you have any questions, reach out to team at ForeFlight. We're always happy to help. Great, thanks, Joey. Uh, Sarah, I've got a question for you. Um, we've had a couple people write in, say, uh, ask about having support for OneDrive uh, to share custom content through Cloud Docs. Is there, is that a possibility in the future? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, keep your eyes peeled uh, for our release emails uh, and update announcements there. Uh, that's something that we hear often uh, and we are excited to support in the near future here. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Dion, I've got a question for you. Um, could you talk a little bit about a little bit more about how you uh, created the CTAF map in the Matsu Valley? Yeah, hey, um, the so the CTAF info is via is published via the FAA uh, chart supplement uh, information brochure, which is available electronically. So you could reference that from either the paper format or the electronic format, and overlay that onto the map using Google Earth or what other tool of choice you have. Of course, it's it's fairly clear from the publication exactly where those in, intersect lines uh, flow. And it's while it's not a direct stencil that you overlay onto uh, Google Earth, uh, you use your best judgment, obviously, you're just basically connecting points with straight lines. So it's not too difficult to do. And uh, using the method that uh, Joey highlighted, which is the polygon uh, construction method, that's how I got it into KML format and bring it back into uh, ForeFlight. Great, thanks, Dion. One more question for you as well. Um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, your flights around Denali? Someone was asking if ADSB use is very common up there. Yeah, it's uh, uh, ADSB is in use, of course. Um, so equipped aircraft will tend to use it, but it's pilot. Well, it's not always used, so it's not a guarantee. Uh, but even if it was, let's say we have a hundred percent coverage with all the traffic uh, active on ADSB. The, one of the biggest challenges there is the terrain. Uh, the terrain is made up of, gra of <laughs> dense, uh, uh, dense material and for the most part granite. And as we know, the ADSB frequency range, I just um, uh, do consider that it's uh, UHF, so it's, nine, it's uh, the two frequencies is 1080, 1090 and 978 meg. Um, they do not propagate well uh, around rocks. Um, and in many cases, those, those uh, transmissions will not even propagate two or three miles around a, a, a vertical wall of granite. So yes, you have that in when you're a clear line of sight between two targets, two aircraft, um, it does show up. But if you look at the map and you, uh, let's say you're looking at the four flight map with ADSB traffic turned on or toggled on, you'll see targets appear and disappear, appear and disappear. So uh, in an area like this, um, the VHF radio is of great help to help with the situational awareness. Of course, your eyes out the cockpit. The problem with just trying to identify, find targets out the window is they blend in. Aircraft will blend in with the terrain because it's not like you're flying over flat country. You really have obstacles that um, that fill the windshield. For the most part, like I mentioned, we're up around somewhere between seven and 10,000 MSL. Remember, the top of the mountain is 20,000 feet. So for the most part, you're flying in a terrain where everything you look at out the window blends in as camouflage. You do not see the other aircraft. So the VHF radio is a great tool uh, to be on the radio, respond and or making position uh, reports and hence the use of the um, um, the, way the reporting point map. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it absolutely does. Um, Dion, I know we've gotten a lot of questions coming in. Are there any others that you'd like to address? No, there, there were uh, a few duplicate questions on the polygons and the labels for the C, for that CTAF map example. Yes, absolutely. You can, uh, it is dynamic. So when you click on it, you can render other data. And uh, for some reason in the demo that I showed, the, the labels, uh, meaning the CTAF frequencies, didn't show up. But of course, that's the entire intent of that exercise is to render the, the CTAF frequencies uh, and overlay that on the map, especially if you're flying into those uh, convergence areas. So you don't have to memorize the frequencies. There are two or three frequencies and most of those zones have an east and a west. And uh, so that's the entire exercise there with that uh, CTAF overlay. But I would just say, just in general, um, and, and the question about the 135, tinker with it, experiment with it. I find it really useful. Uh, you might not have exactly this application with uh, like the off-grid flying, but there might be cases where uh, you want to play with it. And the best to learn anything like this technology, the tooling and how to construct it is just like uh, Sarah mentioned, get the example pack, download that, and then just customize it from that point on. It's really low uh, friction or low barrier to entry. It's not a complicated process. And once you got it going, you can just build on what you have. So that's that would be my advice to somebody 
that will want to experiment with it and see if it's useful in their application. That's great. Thank you, Dion. Uh, one more question here for Sarah. Uh, can you review how source data can be imported into ForeFlight? Yeah, this is something that we kind of glazed over a little bit. Uh, and what I'll do is recommend uh, people who are looking for more guidance to head to our website. We have a pretty comprehensive support page about how to import uh, both individual custom content files or content packs step by step uh, for each different method. So um, as a reminder, you can import over AirDrop, uh, email, Finder, or iTunes, depending on whether you have a Mac or a Windows device, um, a linked cloud drive, of course, uh, and look forward to in the near future, that OneDrive integration. Um, but yeah, you can see all of those step-by-step -step, uh, kind of instructions and guidance uh, on our website. And as a reminder as well, we did get some requests uh, to get access to some of the files that we shared in today's webinar. Um, some of them are available uh, as a sample content pack, uh, and we have individual custom content files on that support page as well. So um, if you're looking to get started, look for kind of a, a skeleton uh, content pack to make your own. Uh, we have those constructed on the website. Um, I also just wanted to put in two cents here and, and say thanks to everyone for attending. Um, as a product manager, I want to acknowledge all of the really great feature requests that came in this afternoon. Um, some are things that we hear really often and some of them are completely brand new. You guys are always coming up with innovative ways to leverage the application. Um, and that's one of my favorite things about custom content, right? Is how flexible it is and, and we're excited to build on that foundation. Um, so just, just wanted to say we hear you and we are tallying each of these to prioritize with our fantastic development team. Uh, so stay tuned for those feature releases this year where you may end up seeing us uh, deliver on some of the great features you've asked for. We don't typically share timelines, but um, I recognized a lot of projects that are already in development uh, in, in the request queue here. So uh, thank you again for joining us and, and keep sharing your requests. Uh, they really help us innovate and, and serve you better. Absolutely. Thank you everyone so much for coming on today. We really appreciate it. Um, I want to look at these links one more time on this uh, slide. One that I should have put here that I didn't is forthlight.com slash support. That's where you're going to find all of the support articles that we've talked about today. Um, that first link there, forthlight.com slash custom dash content is where you can learn more about custom content. Uh, one of the other packs that we have on there is we did a winter flying webinar back in January and, uh, some members of our team put together a, uh, a custom content layer uh, showing cold temperature restricted airports across the U.S. So that's something that could be helpful for you, um, even though it is getting warmer outside. Uh, next, uh, the pilot's guide is where you can learn so much about using custom content. You can find that online or in ForeFlight. You can also register for more webinars and watch past ones. And this webinar will be posted online in the next 24 hours at ForeFlight.com slash webinars. And you can always reach out to the pilot support team with any questions at team at fourflight.com. With that, I want to thank you all so much for coming, and we'll see you on the next webinar.